Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, I heard Pastor Tom did an awesome job last week. I was at my... Amen. Um, we are uh, in a series uh, about prayer, uh, pray, and uh, that's kind of what I called it. Nothing really flashy. Um, prayer is kind of a funny thing. I was thinking about it this week because I think the word prayer uh, carries with it all kinds of connotations and maybe a different context for every single person in this room. Some of you are like, I love prayer. And others of you are like, I don't know how to do it. Um, and so what I've found is that across the board, Christians seem to have a low le level of guilt around the subject of prayer. Um, like we kind of know we should be doing it better or more or at all. And we kind of also, if we're honest, we aren't even sure if we're doing it right. Um, there's a whole lot of insecurity, usually around the topic of, of prayer. And, and so what we end up doing is we often like we lean into or onto other people who we perceive are doing a great job. They're killing it when it comes to prayer, right? Because they're getting results. So they just sound awesome whenever they pray. And you're like, man, I, want, I need to do what they're doing. I need to pay attention. And, and so we end up... Um, learning how to pray, not because we took a class on it, um, but because we watched other people do it. And then we kind of try to do some of the things, the tricks and, of the trade, right, when it comes to prayer. Um, the truth is that we can, we can learn some pretty odd and quirky things from watching other people pray. Um, my guess is uh, that there are probably some things that you've picked up along the way by watching and listening to other people pray that you do now that you don't even realize you do or why you do it. Um, what, what I've found is that a lot of the things that we have adopted, even as individuals, like in, I'll speak for myself, in prayer have much more to do with um, habits or tradition or things that I've watched rather than the Bible. And um, so I, I wrote some of them down. And um, some of these I, I grew up with. I grew up in, you know, um, pretty conservative liturgical church. And so here are some things that I learned just from watching other Christians pray. If that's all you got, this is, this is what you might have learned. The first one is this. Close your eyes or it doesn't count. It doesn't really count. Like you got to... For, unless you're a pastor. All the pastors, I, literally, I'm like in groups of pastors praying and they're all eyes open. Like, it's weird. It's weird. Um, but pretty much, this is the rule. And this is what I learned growing up. It, close your eyes or it doesn't count. Um, the second one is fold your hands and to engage it. And if you're really serious, you can lock and load, right? They, then that, you know, it's going somewhere. Um, this, the third one I wrote down was get on your knees if you really mean it. Um, because, you know, it's like, okay, the posture, and this is what, okay, i got to get down. i got to do something to be able to, like, truly engage. Um, the fourth thing I learned just from watching other people pray was that God doesn't like awkward silences. And so fill it with keywords, like repeating his name to him, you know, like when we aren't quite sure what to say. We do it, right? I do it, right? I find myself doing it. I'm like, what am I doing, Father God, Father God, Father God? I, like, I just, just kind of like, we just, you all know what I'm talking about. You're like, I do that. Um, we like to put it on God like he doesn't like awkward silences when maybe it's the other way around. But the, the fifth thing I wrote down was, and this is kind of the overarching thing, which is the right words get the best results. So you listen to someone that is so eloquent and they're so good at praying. And it's like, I can't even, I don't even know. I don't even know what they said. They said big words, beseech. What does that even mean, right? Like, and you get to the place where you're like, I feel like I can't do the thing because I don't know the right words. So I don't want to say anything because I don't want to mess it up and I don't want to get it wrong or ask something that's inappropriate, right? Um, so I poke fun at it a little bit because, because these are things that I do. These are things that I've picked up along the way. And I want to give you some good news here. And the good news is this, that um, Jesus' disciples, when Jesus was walking on earth, right, uh, were doing the exact same thing that you and I do which is, okay, I'm watching other people and going to see what they do. In Luke chapter 11, the Bible says that uh, in the very beginning, chapter 11, verse 1, they, the, 
the disciples were watching Jesus pray. And that must have been a sight. Can you just imagine, like, watching Jesus connect with his Father? It's like God and God, and they're both taught. It's this, I mean, talk about a mind-blowing experience to, to literally watch Jesus pray. And as they're watching, one brave disciple goes up to Jesus and says, hey, like, asks for the one thing that all of them were um, either too proud to ask or too scared or, I don't know, is this appropriate? And this is what they say in Luke chapter 11, verse 1. He says, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. Teach us to pray. Now, this is a bit unusual because these are a bunch of Jewish guys who grew up praying. Like they would have had to learn how to pray at a very early age as As Jews, they would have memorized prayers and been able to recite them from memory. Like, so they they knew how to pray. This wasn't the deal. They they already knew how to pray. And yet, as we look out through the the New Testament, the only things that the, the disciples overtly asked Jesus to teach them was teach us how to pray. Like him. Can you teach us to do the thing that you're doing? They don't ask Jesus to teach them how to preach like him or teach like him or sing like him or heal like him or raise people from the dead like him. Like the, what's really interesting is that they ask him, hey, could you teach us how to pray? So what exactly are they asking for? If they already know how to pray, they already have a bunch of, you know, memorized prayers and scripture memorized that they can pray out loud, then then what is it that they're asking for? It's almost like they're like looking at Jesus and watching him and thinking, I want to, I want to do that. Like, I don't, like I do the thing. I do, I could, I've been praying since I was a little kid, but like what you're doing, could you teach me to do that? Like, because that looks fun. Like that looks powerful and exciting. That looks different than anything that I've ever experienced. And that makes, if I'm going to be honest, Jesus, that makes you like look different after you do it. Can you teach me how to do that? And what's interesting is that Jesus' response is not like what I would normally think that he would say, like, guys, are you kidding me? Like, we've been together. I mean, how long... How long have you been wondering about this? You're kidding me, right? Like you don't, you want to know how to pray? Now, just now you're finally asking me this question? But what Jesus says is this, when you pray, pray like this. And then he launches into the most famous prayer. We call it the Lord's Prayer. It's really kind of a less of, his prayer and more of a teaching on prayer. Um, And many of us grew up reciting this. Like even if you're kind of like nominally around church, you probably know the Our Father is what we called it growing up. Like it's the Lord's Prayer. And I bet, I bet that many of you could recite it with me. I bet that many of you can't help but recite it with me. Like, you're going to, even if you don't say it out loud, you're going to be like, I know this one. I know this one. And you're going to be muttering it. I know it. I get it. So let's just, to humor everybody, let's walk through it. And in typical, if you came from old school church fashion, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And then the Protestants added the really good part that all the Sopranos love. I know, you Catholics in here, you're like, wait, we, I thought it was trespasses, right? I, okay. Then they say, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Come on, I heard you. For help. Come on, 
help me out. I need some help here. You guys are like, oh, you sing it. You sing it. Like, no, I don't want to sing this. Y'all know this, right? What I find really interesting is that, and I don't know why, but whenever I get around Christians and we, the, the Our Father, or this portion of Scripture is read, like I find like we fall into like a religious mindset. Like almost like you just stepped up to like a memorization thing or, a, or like a recitation. Like I know this one, I can get it. Don't worry, I, I, I know this one. I, I can recite this. Because I want us to consider something and, and it kind of peels back from the whole memorization thing that maybe you grew up with. What if Jesus, what if what he prayed here wasn't meant to be something that we memorize or recite or sing? What if, what if Jesus was actually answering this brave disciple's request? Um, what if he's teaching us something that was meant to change everything? Because I guarantee you, the very first time that those words left Jesus' mouth, it would have blown their minds. It could have been a mic drop moment, walk off the stage experience. Like, this teaching on prayer would have immediately shifted their thinking, rattled their theology, and maybe even changed their worldview. This was less about listening to Jesus pray a really sweet prayer and more about a teaching that quite honestly changed everything for them. And so Jesus leads into the Lord's Prayer that we call it in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. He says this, and I like it, pray then like this. Pray then like this. He wasn't saying, okay, recite this prayer. Mimic what I do. Eyes closed, hands together, knees on the floor. Repeat after me. Do the thing. He says, when you pray, pray then like this. And so today we're going to focus on the first part of the teaching on prayer. Um, Matthew 6, 9, he says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We're going to focus just on that today. Um, there's a story of a Sunday school teacher that asked his second grade class for some names of God. Like, okay, kids, give me some names of God. And this one child raised their hand like, I know, I know, I know, I know. Okay, what's the name of God? Howard. <laughs> How? That's a new one. Howard, really? Where did, you, where did you get the name Howard? And the kid's like, oh, that's easy. That's, that, I got it. Our Father who art in heaven, Howard be thy name. <laughs> like, got it. He says it. He literally says it, right? Like, <laughs> it's actually in these first two words, though, our Father, Jesus launches his teaching on prayer. And I think... I think, quite honestly, they may be the, the two most important words of this lesson. Like, if not the most important, I think that Jesus says these first two words first because he's like, if you got to wrestle these to the ground before you do the rest. Um, and he just says, our Father. He doesn't start out by saying, our King, although he is our creator, although he is, what is Jesus getting at? It's this, when you pray, understand who you're talking to. And so the title of my message today is Your Father. Your Father. And this is so significant because um, in life, not just in prayer, but in life, like we approach people um, based upon the relationship that we have with them. And so the relationship that you have with someone determines how you interact with them, how you encounter them, how you approach them. So in your notes, I've put a, a few examples. These are not exhaustive, they're just examples. Um, the first one was like if a, a random stranger. Like when you approach, or if you approached a random stranger, 
you approach them based upon what I need from you. Um, I, don't, I don't normally go up to a stranger in a restaurant and ask them for a bite of food or a sip of their coffee. Um, no, that's why, because it's, it's much more sterile and impersonal when you go up to a, to a stranger. So what I need from you, I may approach you and ask you for the time or for directions or is this train going north? Is it, am I in the right place? Like I may ask you questions, but it's like more of like what I need from you. Why? Because we don't know each other. We're not in relationship. You're a random stranger. I'm not going to go up and just share my life story or my heart with you. I'm just going to get something that I need from you. Now, if it's a business relationship, um, you, you approach a business relationship based upon what I have for you. It's a conditional relationship. Business relationships are conditional. It's something like I got something that you want. Um, I can do something for you. And depending on my performance, depending on my persuasive words, you will either choose to either pursue the relationship or not pursue the relationship. But it's very, it's a conditional. It can be seen maybe even as a friendship, but it's a conditional friendship. It's a conditional relationship. And the third one is family. And this is the one that I want to drill down on today. The family relationship is altogether different. Altogether different. Because a family relationship is based upon what I am to you, or rather, who I am to you, or who you are to me. Like a family relationship begins from a place of identity. It's not about what I need from you, what I can do for you, what I have for you. It's more about like who I am to you. I am your child. I am your sibling. I am your parent. You are in my family. Like it's, it starts with identity and then works from there. For example, my kids don't get accepted into my family or more accepted into my family based upon the chores that they do. I may be more happy with them, but that doesn't, that's not the entrance requirement to be, to be a part of my, my family, right? Um, and in a similar way, you can't become a part of my family by doing things for me. You, you don't earn your way, deserve your way, get your way in by doing something for me or having this sort of business relationship going on back and forth. Like, it begins from a place of identity and it works itself out from there. Um, and speaking of family, the reality is this, you don't get to choose them, do you? No, you don't. You, you don't get to choose your family. In fact, if you were to be honest, um, if you had the choice, you might not choose them. <laughs> right? You, uh, well, I mean, it's because family relationships are altogether different altogether different. Like even if you, even if you um, come from a family that you would identify as dysfunctional, which some of us have come from, right? Like, okay, I would identify my family growing up, whatever was a dysfunctional family. The sheer fact that you call it dysfunctional shows that you just instinctively know what it should have been, what it, what it could have been what it should have looked like, what it could have looked like. In fact, some of our dysfunctional relationships in our families proves my point that family relationships are altogether separate, different. Why? Because some of you are still in a level of relationship with a person in your family that if what they did to you was a friend or as a business associate, you would have nothing to do with them anymore. Why would you even talk to them? Well, they're still my sister. Well, it's still my brother. Because family is altogether different. It puts up with things that you wouldn't put up with from just anybody. And so why do I talk about this today? Is this, that... When Jesus starts out teaching on prayer by saying, our Father, he's not only communicating who God is, but also who you are. 
Jesus is wanting a relational revelation of family, something that is altogether different than the mute idols or other things that you can worship. He's like, I'm wanting you to wrestle this to the ground, and this is huge. So before you start praying, before you go on and, 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 and the rest of this, our Father, like you start here, wrestle that to the ground, know who it is that you're talking to, and, and, and by the sheer fact that he calls himself Father, that makes something different about you. The Apostle Paul describes it, in this relationship in Galatians 4. In verse 4, he says this, When the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has also made you an heir. So I want to talk about three things. Three things that when you start to pray to your father, three things that you recognize. The first one is this, your adoption into God's family. When you identify God as our father, my father, your father, you automatically assume and recognize your adoption into God's family. And it's really important for us to make this distinction. Um, sometimes people will say in churches and outside of churches, well, like, you know what, everyone is a child of God and we're all in God's family. I don't, I don't mean to, like, to poke that, but that's not necessarily how the Bible portrays things. Um, you may get offended, but let's take a look at what the Word of God says. John chapter 1, verse 12 says, Yet all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So here's the, here's the reality. We, we kind of were like, oh, we're all, you know, you, we're all loved. We're all created in the image of God, but we're not all called children of God. We become the family of God when we believe and we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior. The Bible makes it really clear and describes that when we receive Jesus, we are adopted into the family of God. And when that happens, well, when God adopts you as, as his child and he is your father, what happens is you get a new identity. You get a new identity. This happens in every adoption. Take, strip away this whole spiritual stuff that we've been talking about here and like calling God our Father and stuff. When you are adopted, let's say you're a child that gets adopted, in, in that adoption, at the, at the smack of the gavel, at the signing of the document, you are now given a new identity. Legally speaking, relationally speaking, something has shifted. It's the exact same thing that happens when we receive Christ. We become adopted into God's family so that we can boldly call him our father. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 talks about this, this adoption and the difference in the new identity. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation, the new identity, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. It's important for us to remember when we're talking about adoption, we're talking about sonship and fatherhood and all that, that adoption is not an act of a child. Adoption is the act of the father. The child is received and chosen and accepted into the family. And when the father adopts you, you are given a new identity. The old is gone, the new is here. And the pounding of the gavel and the signing of the document, something changes in an instant. But how many of you realize that this new identity can take a lifetime to receive? Right? Like, okay, great. You know, we received Christ as, as our Lord and our Savior, and then, all, okay, now we have this new identity, and we're like, okay, great, this is... But, but like that, just getting a new name, just receiving a new identity doesn't mean that the old name and the old identity don't try to rise up and play in themselves out and like, 
and come out in, in weird ways. Like, even though God calls you son and daughter, for someone to truly accept this love, this adoptive love of God, it can take years. It can take a lifetime. I, I believe that even now, like what, I'm 25 years in, like, even now, I'm still understanding and God is still revealing his love to me. And it's not even in the revelation of it. It's in the understanding and receiving of it. It's like, I'm not, I'm not worthy of that. No, 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 no. I'm not. And God has arrested me many times and caused me to have to receive it in a new way. So not only that, do you, do you understand that you have been adopted into God's family? The second point is this. When you pray to your father, you recognize that you have privileged access to him. I want to remind you, Christian, if you are in Christ, you have privileged access to the father. Privileged access to God. Galatians 4 verse 6 says this. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit calls out, Abba, Father. That word Abba actually is like a, it's a family word. It's not a business word. It's not a friend word. It's like calling your father, dad. Hey, dad. Nobody gets to call me dad, except for my kids. And it would be weird if they just came to me, excuse me, father, right? They just, hey, dad. It's a family word. And so even though our God is the creator of the universe, he doesn't require us to approach him as such. That is crazy. That we, that we begin from a place of our father. And I've heard so many prayers, like eloquent prayers, people that I'm like, man, they're so good at praying. And they'll start out with like these big words, like almighty king, omnipotent, omnipresent creator of the heavens and the earth, all that is seen and unseen, I beseech thee, and all of these things. But, but Jesus says, actually, in his teaching on prayer, he's like, you could just start it out like this. Hi, dad. Our father it's not wrong that you, that you acknowledge that he is the creator of the universe and he is the almighty, that he could sm smote you, smite you, so mighty smiter. Like he could do all those things. But, but how he tells you to begin talking to him is, hey, dad, hey, hi. And so we quickly realize that God is not necessarily impressed as I am by eloquent speech. And what he desires is just to hear from his kid. That, like prayer isn't supposed to be seen as a burden. It's supposed to be a place where you can bring your burdens to your dad. Prayer isn't informing God of something that he is unaware of. Prayer is actually just inviting your dad into something that is troubling you. Prayer is not, not about requesting a private audience with the king. It's, it's like a, the Christian's right to privileged access with their dad. Luke chapter 18, verse 15 says, People were also bringing babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked him. Je Jesus called the children to him and said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Abby said something a few weeks ago that has stuck to me and I know to many of you. And it was this comment, she said, there are there are no adults in the family of God. He only has children. That never changes. That never changes. So when you pray, you understand that you're not, you're not heard based upon your success or your goodness or your serving or the words that you eloquently use. Jesus is saying that like, 
you have privileged access to God based on your relationship as a child to him alone. Changes everything. The third point, last one is this. When you pray to your father, you recognize your immeasurable inheritance as his child. Your immeasurable inheritance as his child. 1 John 3.1 says, See, see what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. I firmly believe that sometimes we need to be reminded of the ridiculously undeserved, unconditional inheritance that has lavished on us as children of God. And do not forget that it is not because you earned it, it isn't even because you deserve it, or, or because you worked for it. Um, I was thinking about this because a lot of this is this family talk, you know, relates to even, even me as a father. So, If you're, if you're a parent, you know what the sound of your kid crying out in the middle of the night sounds like. Like just crying out for their parent, crying out. Maybe they woke up from a bad dream or something, but they're just crying out. Can I just tell you, all of those years, I never once turned over and asked my wife a qualifying question. Like... Did Carter feed the dog yesterday? Because if he didn't, he can cry all stinking night. <laughs> Did Molly clean her room this week? Oh, really? Cry away, right? No. No, I actually, I don't respond to their cries, to their needs, because they deserve it or because they did something nice for me. Like, they're always going to be my kids, so they can cry out and I'll always be there. They, they don't earn audience with me based upon what they did for me. It is identity first. You're my kid. I am running in there. I, I don't know what's going on. Like, I, I'm here, though. Dad's here. And it's not on a contingency basis. It's not on a conditional basis. This is the Father. When God says our Father, this is the Father, the Father's heart. The point that Jesus is making in this, in the beginning of this teaching is this, when you understand that you are an adopted son or daughter, when you understand that like you have privileged access to your dad in heaven, when you understand that you have an immeasurable inheritance as his child, it ought to change how you pray. Man, it just takes the pressure off, to be honest, because it can be messy. My kids don't worry about how they're crying in the middle of the night. They're like, oh, was it too loud? Was it too whiny? They're like, never. I wish they would, right? Like, they're just crying out. They're like, dad, mom, I had a bad dream, whatever. Like, there's no, like, thought about, like, well, I, should, I maybe should position myself or change my, you know, like, no. Like, they just, they're just crying out. And the beautiful part of this as we begin this like, idea of studying what prayer looks like is that Jesus is making you realize that, that prayer has very little to do with how you do it. How forceful you are, how loud you were, what the words that you use, how polished it was, how eloquent it sounded. And you begin to realize that it begins with you're his child, and you've got a really big, good dad. Like, what if prayer has less to do with me getting God to do things or changing his mind about things and has much more to do with me coming to the terms of my new identity and allowing it to begin changing me? Which means... What if you aren't meant to learn how to pray by watching other people do it? What if you aren't meant to pray by, by taking a class to, to learn how to do it? And I don't, there's nothing wrong with that. But like, what, what if that in its very essence is not what it's about? What if we're to learn how to pray by praying? 
like my kids crying out in the night? Like, what if, what if that is like the beginning of understanding what kind of a father he is? The Bible actually says that he's near to the brokenhearted, that he's close to those who are crushed in spirit. It's almost like it's saying, if you are at your end, he's closest. Because the end of ourselves is the beginning of him. Amen? Amen. What if that was never the point, that you just fold your hands right, close your eyes, knees on the floor, all the right things? What if, what if it was just about your dad just being so stinking excited that you tried? That you're just talking to him. He wants to hear from his children. Why don't you stand with me? We're going to close with a song today. And the song, we've, we've sung it over the past month or two. And it's called Run to the Father. I want to... Um, I feel like I've got a word for, for someone in here and, and maybe a few of us, right? But um, we're get, if you've been around here and we sang this song, Run to the Father, it, um, man, just that word father, as we're coming up on Father's Day next week, has all kinds of stuff attached to it based upon our earthly fathers, our earthly families. Functional, dysfunctional, whatever, whatever, whatever it looked like. Um, and I would say this to, to I've, I've, this is the word. You may feel like you have a prayer problem, but you actually have a father problem. You may feel like you're like, I don't know, I just feel like my... my my, everyone else can pray, but I can't. Like, I, I just can't get connected. I feel like it just doesn't do anything. It doesn't, I don't, I, I don't feel like it's a safe place for me to just express my heart to God. Like, I just, I would say this. Like, if you're in that place, you may feel like you've got a prayer problem. I'm just not doing it right. I, I don't know. I'm not. But what the problem may actually be is a father issue. And I just want to take a moment today and speak to that father wound. That wound of like, man, we sing that song, Run to the Father, and I don't know what that looks like because I just always feel like running away. It doesn't seem like it's a safe place to run towards. I want to run back away from it because it isn't safe or wasn't safe for me. Um, and so maybe you keep God at our arm's length because it seems safer that way. You think like, well, I just... You know, I don't, I don't know if he's approachable. I've just never really connected to God in prayer. And running to the Father in heaven is something that you've just simply never done. So as we enter into this time, I just want to give you an opportunity to become a child today. The Bible says it's the only way to get in. And so this connects with you, like maybe you feel like that word is for you, that scripture tells us that when we believe that we, and we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, that we're adopted into his family and it doesn't look at all like our earthly family. I think in many of us, it mirrored it. But the inheritance, the love of this Father in heaven is so much greater than even our earthly fathers could ever muster. So if that's where you're at right now, maybe you've never done this before, I want to give you an opportunity to, to do that, to do that right now. So it, I, I want to invite you to pray with me, but if, if I could just have everyone just bow your heads. And I just want to speak specifically to the individuals in here that just feel like, yeah, you know what? Like, I think you're talking to me right now. I feel like that word's for me. All over this place, I just want to encourage you, just lift your hand up before, before your Father in heaven. God, I, I want you to correct that in me. Correct that in me. All over this place. Yep. Okay. Correct that in me, Lord. Correct that in me. I want to lead you in a prayer, and there's nothing magical about it. It's just coming to the place of, like, I, I know I need to be a kid, so... 
I receive you. You pray this with me. Father God, I see you right now. I haven't always been looking for you or running to you. But in this moment, I realize that you've been looking for me my whole life. So today, I confess my sin and that I need a Savior. I confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He came and died, was buried and rose again so that I could have more and better life. I ask that right now that you would forgive me of my sins into my life and be my Lord and Savior. I run to you. Take control of my life. Fill me with your spirit.